Hello everyone, Kay in the shell here. This video is an introduction to the assembly language. The reason I'm doing that is not that I want to be able to write assembly code myself, that is too cumbersome, but rather I want to have enough understanding of assembly to be able to do CTF, that is to say capture the flag challenges that involve reverse engineering a binary program. And that will be the point of further videos. So today, we'll see how to write a Hello World program in assembly. That will teach us the basics of the assembly language, the all-important syscall instruction. It will also show us how to play with registers, as well as how to compile and run assembly code. So first thing first, what's assembly? Assembly is the language that is closest to the machine. While languages like C and Python need to be heavily translated for a computer to understand and execute, assembly is basically the language that your processor speaks. There are actually several types of assembly languages. Each processor architecture has its own. In 2020, most processor desktop and laptop computer are of the x86 family. If we look at the Wikipedia page for x86, we find all the Intel and AMD processors. There is one other family of general purpose processors that is well known and exists broadly. It's the ARM. This is the processor family that powers most mobile phones and tablets, as well as the recent Apple M1 computers. While the concepts are the same, the details might be different. For the intent of my videos, we'll look into x86 assembly. I just said before that assembly was basically machine code. While it's very close, it's not completely true. It's still slightly adapted, typically to use short mnemonics that are more human readable than number codes. As such, since it's a representation of machine code, there are several manners or syntaxes to show it. The most common ones are the Intel syntax and the AT&T syntax. We can see a sample of the two flavors in the x86 assembly language wiki page. For my videos, we'll use the Intel flavor that I find a bit terser. However, there is no real difference between the two and you should feel free to use the AT&T syntax. Note that the compiler we'll use today only supports the Intel syntax. We'll learn a few concepts one step at a time. Just so you know, we'll work on the Linux. I likely do a complementary video to do the same thing on macOS at a later time. In my shell, on the left, I am in my Mac terminal. It is configured with my code editor and with all its bells and whistles. On the right, I will run a Kali Linux Docker container that will have access to the same file. And that's where we'll compile and run our code. First thing first, in my Linux container, let's install NASM, which is the assembly compiler we'll be using today. Now, before writing anything, we need to do two things on top of the assembly language that we'll discover, and those are the registers and syscalls. Registers are places where you can store data. Those places are used by the computer to perform operations or transfer data. You can think of the registers a bit like variables in a programming language with major caveats. Registers are limited in number and registers have a fixed size. It's 64 bits or eight bytes on modern 64 bits architecture. You should also note that some registers have a special meaning. The x86 assembly wikibook has all the information you need. In particular, each register has a name. In 64 bits architecture, register name starts with the letter R. There are eight general purpose registers. You can reference a subpart of the 64 bit register with another name. For example, EAX is the 32 least significant bits of the RAX register. There is an instruction pointer, RIP, that holds the address of the currently executed 
program instruction, 64-bit architecture, add eight general purpose register R8 to R15. And that's enough about registers. Let's talk about syscalls. Syscalls are a way to call functions. Those functions are provided by the kernel and are invoked following very specific conventions. Here again, the x86 assembly wikibook has it all. In particular, it states that all information that needs to be passed to syscalls are to be put in general purpose registers. That each syscall is referenced by a number. That the syscall number should be placed in the RAX register. That there are two ways to invoke a syscall. By an interruption, by setting everything up and then calling int 0x80, or via a more recently created syscall instruction. You'll know that the registers used by the interruption method and the syscall instruction method are not the same. Also, the function reference number those methods use are not the same either. In this video, we'll only work with the syscall instruction, which is the most common way nowadays. Now we have all the concepts we need and we can start to write some assembly code. Let's first simply write a program that exits with a specific exit code. We can go to a nice website that references the Linux syscalls and look for exit. We find that it is syscall number 60. So we need to put the value 60 in register RAX. By double clicking on the line, we can also see that it expects one parameter, the code with which to exit, and that this should be put in RTI. We use exit code 42 to prove that what we do works. The assembly function that is used to change the value of a register is move. This function takes the register to be changed, followed by a comma, and then the value to set. In our text editor, we can now type move rax60 to put the syscall number of the exit function 60 that we found earlier. Now we want the exit code to be in rti, so we type move rti, and we want it 42 as an exit code. And now all that remains is to call syscall the instruction that will perform the previously set system call. Let's try to compile that. I'm going to save my file, go into my Linux box. We use our NASM compiler. We instruct it to build a Linux 64 bits executable. Then we say that we want to output the result in a hello object file. And then we give the source file, hello.nasm. Then we want to link this program. I'm not gonna spend any time explaining what linking is. Suffice to say that it's a necessary step. LD is the GNU linker. It will output the program based on the object file. And here it complains that it cannot find the symbol start. And this is basically the symbol that is expected by the compiler to tell where the program starts because it does not necessarily start at the top of the file. So let's fix that. We want to have a start label like so. And we'll also want to declare this label as global so that it's exported for the linker to see. Don't worry too much about that. This is all details. Just know that your program should have a start label that tells where is the first instruction and that this label should be declared as global. Now, if you compile again and link again, it works. If we look at what's in there, we can see that it has produced a binary file. And we can see that it is already executable because we produced an executable file. 
Now, what if we execute it? Mm, okay, so we only call it a program that should exit, so it feels like it did not do anything. But let's check the return code. In a shell, the return code of the latest trend command is stored in the special global variable question mark. So if you have not run anything since your program, you can ask for the value of this special variable. And here it says 42. So we did indeed return 42 without program. We were able to control the exit syscall. Let's now write something on the standard output. Back to our syscall table. Let's look for write. Write is syscall number one. It expects a file descriptor in RDI, a pointer to a string in RSI, and the size of the string in RDX. For the file descriptor, that's easy enough. We want to write to the standard output, which by convention is file descriptor 1. The size of the string, I guess we can count manually, so that's easy too. But what about the pointer? So the thing is, the string you want to write on the standard output might not fit in an 8 bytes register. Knowing that each character is encoded by one byte, you can only fit 8 characters in a register. So to work around this limit, write expect to receive in RSI not the string to write, but the address in memory where it can find the string. In memory, this string can occupy an arbitrary length. That's the reason why the write syscall expects a size. It needs to know where the string finishes so as not to print things from the memory that are coming from elsewhere. This means now that we have to put some value in memory. We are going to do it the odd way, very manually, in order to discover more things in this tutorial video. We have an assembly instruction called push. This instruction pushes the value that is inside the register to the top of the stack. Let's play with that. We'll construct the string hello world one character at a time. First, we want to put the letter H on the stack. If we use Python, we can find that letter uppercase H is 72, and that this is 0x48 in hexadecimal. So we'll put this value in a general purpose register, say R8. So that's 0x48, that's our H. We can add comments in assembly with the semicolon. You can say semicolon and you can say this is H. Now we want to push this value onto the stack. So we can now do push R8. Now we need to call our write syscall. So we set it up. Syscall, the write syscall is number one. So we put one in RAX. Then we want to write onto std out. So we say that it's file descriptor one and this is in RDI. Now we want to say that we have one character to write. So we put the value one in RDX. And the last thing we have to set is the register RSI, which expects the address of the string to display. Now the string is on the top of the stack and the top of the stack is always pointed to by the RSP register. So we can move the value that is currently in RSP into RSI and then we can make our syscall. Let's save and let's try. So we compile. We link and we, oh, yeah, it worked. And we execute. And we can see it worked. We can see our letter H here that appeared. You'll note that because we did not write any new line character, the next prompt is render on the same line. We'll take care about that when we have the full string. Now let's do the same thing with the letter E by dropping into Python again and by asking for the value in hexadecimal of the letter E, we find 0x65. 
Now remember that modern computer architecture are 64 bits. This means that registers are 64 bits or 8 bytes wide. We only used one byte for the H value, so we can put the E value next to it in the same operation. So we put 65. We comment that we want to write H E now. We should also not forget to increment the size of the string we want to display. And we can go at it again. So compile, link, and execute. Okay, that's interesting. Instead of getting HE as we expected, we get EH. The reason for that is that our processor architecture is using so called little endianness. To put it simply, it means that in a register that contains several bytes, the bytes are arranged in reverse order. For a string that is written byte by byte, that means the character appear reversed. With this new knowledge, we can fix it. Let's put the 65 before the 48. And go about it again, compile, link, execute, and now we have the expected string. So let's complete the string now. Let's drop again into Python. Let's say that our string is hello, comma, world. And now let's say that we want x or the of x for x in s. And we get all the characters we want. And we also want the code for backslash n, 0xa. OK, so now 48, we have it 65, we have it. We want 2 times 6c. That's four characters. Now we have a 6f, OK, 2c, 2, 0, and 77. And that's it, we have our eight bytes. Okay, so let's say this is hello, comma, w. Again, let's try, let's drop out of that. And maybe SM, D, hello. What happened? Oh, we did not change the size of our string. We now have eight bytes to read. So let's try again. Okay, this time it worked. Now let's add the rest of the string. So we have a register that was full. So let us write a completely new value in the same register again and push it again. Now we want to change also the size of our string. It is now 14 characters. You'll note that there is the new line character at the end. We have to count it also. We save and again. Compile, link, execute. So we have an ordering issue again, but the problem is different this time. We want the hello part to be displayed first. That means that the write function needs to read it first. But for the write function to need that first, it needs to be on top of the stack. And to be on top of the stack, it needs to be pushed to the stack last. So we just need to change this to first write the end of the string and then the start of the string so that the start of the string is at the top of the stack. We save again, we compile, link, and execute. And now we have exactly the expected string. So we took the manual difficult road there, but I wanted to show you how to push register values onto the stack, how little indianness works and kind of reverse our strings, and the fact that the stack is, well, a stack. So that's to say it's a last in first out construct. So the start of a long string needs to be put last on the stack. So it's encountered first by the calling write function. Now, if we want to do it the easy way, we can use something that's called a data byte. It's basically a variable. Such constants are generally put in a different section of the program. So let's change the code to use a data byte. So first let's change our code to put 
uh, proper sections there. So the code is supposed to be in a text section. And ASM was not complaining, but that's what it's supposed to be. Now we'll add also before that a data section in which we can put basically variables. Now we define an str label that references this location, and then we define the data by itself with db, and then we can put the string we want, which is hello world. And then we also want a new line character. We can now remove the manual construction of the string. And we can tell the program that the string is not in the stack anymore. It's in somewhere in the program at the str location. And indeed, str, the labels in the assembly source file, they store the address at which they are located. So str here stores the address where the data byte is defined, which is where the string is. Okay, so let's save. Let's run it, compile, link, and run. And it still works. But now we use a proper variable, which is much easier to read, obviously. I'll conclude with another trick. We should not compute by hand the length of the string we want to display. This is a dangerous practice. If we pass too big a number, we'll expose some data from the stack that we did not intend to show to the users and that in turn could be used by an attacker. So the trick consists in playing with addresses. We have seen that str stores the address of the data byte. Now say we put a label next to the data byte and call it str len. Now, because those things are contiguous in memory, the length of the data byte is the str len address minus the str address. And this is a length in bytes. But it's also the length of the string, since one character takes one byte of storage. So the value that is stored at str len address is a number. We'll introduce that with the equal equ keyword. Now we said that this is equal to the current address. So there is a specific way to designate that, which is the dollar sign minus the str address. So now str len is a numerical variable that, store, that stores the length of the string. Okay, let's try that. So rgx is now str len. Let's save, compile, link, execute, and it still works. And that's it for today. We saw that assembly is a language very close to the one the machine understands. We saw what registers are and what syscalls are. We saw how to structure a simple assembly program and we saw how to compile it and run it. As a bonus, I'll do a couple of short videos to complement this one. In the first one, we'll build the same program but with the AT&T syntax and the GNU AS compiler. In the second one, we'll do the same program but for Mac. That's it for today. Bye-bye.